But the one thing about theater that makes it different than film, TV, any kind of other performance art is that they're humans speaking in front of you in real time. And they're experiencing these very human conditions. There's nothing that compares to that. Once it's happening, it's happening in real time. Once it's over, it's over and it only exists in your memory. Every artist has a story worth telling. Yes, even you. But I get it. Writing your artist statement and talking about your work can be hard. Where do you start? What should you say so that your words are a bridge, not a barrier to your audience? My name is BJ Carey. I'm a writer and photographer, and I want to help. Because I know from experience that when you get to know your narrative, embrace the story about why you do what you do, you gain the confidence you need to write and talk about your work with clarity and impact. And who knows, you might even start to enjoy it. Welcome everyone to the second interview on the Get to Know Your Narrative podcast. I'm really excited to bring this one to you. This was a lot of fun. In this interview, we're going to talk to a local actor named Anna Jordan. Her and I both went through a program here in Omaha based out of Amplify Arts called Artist Inc. Her sister Emily and I had gone through the program together in the following year. Anna went through the program and so she reached out to me with, a, with some questions a couple times and I invited her to come on to the podcast and share some of her story and she was very enthusiastic about that. And I was excited because I honestly, I love talking to actors. I love learning about the acting process. It's something I started studying back when I was in school for photography. Uh, when I first read a book called Acting the First Six Lessons by Richard Boleslavsky. Uh, it was a book that photographer Minor White would have his students read and I thought that was kind of fascinating because I couldn't under I didn't really know what was that connection why would he introduce this to photography students and as soon as I read that book I was like that's why I get it and I just thought it was incredibly fascinating how much the work of the actor overlaps with the work of the photographer and how in many ways us as photographers and actors are sourcing a lot of the same material to do our craft and so I got really fascinated with acting and the process of acting and studied that for several years, took some acting classes myself. I've done just a tiny bit of acting, but I was really excited to talk to Anna because I think acting is one of my aspirational art practices, if, you, if, if that makes sense. It's one of those things that I hope I get to do in my lifetime as far as expanding what I do as an artist. And so I was really excited to talk to her. We had a great conversation. She talks a lot about her experience performing Shakespeare and some of her formative performances that helped shape her as an actor, uh, both in school and after school. And she's got some really great insight. She's got a lot of enthusiasm. And I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Omaha actor Anna Jordan. Welcome. Thank you, Anna, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So um, what were you What were you doing today? Today was a really busy day. I actually had an audition this morning. Excellent. Yeah, and it was a musical audition, which I don't do very often, so I was really nervous for it. Yeah. But uh, I did that this morning, and it actually went better than I thought I would. And then I had two shows today, back to back. <laughs> yeah. And then I came home, and now we're here. Um, that's really cool. So what was the musical that you auditioned for? Uh, it's the Christmas Carol on tour, the na national tour uh, with Nebraska Theater Caravan. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I've never done it before. I've, yeah. I've never done a national tour. I've done a regional tour before, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. See what happens. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like it went well? I did. The singing part could have been better, I think. And it was scary because we were all uh, listening to each other audition. Oh, okay, and that's yeah. just scary and <laughs> yeah. weird and bad but then I was called back to read sides which are parts oh, of the script that yeah. you get a chance to read so that that's, went well oh good good that's that's cool yeah have you ever done a touring 
uh, performance like that before? I have. Not a musical, but uh, a couple years ago, I did a regional tour of As You Like It, which is Shakespeare. Okay. And that one was like a 70-minute cutting that goes to schools. Yeah. So with that, there's there's always a talk back after the show, and then you do workshops with students. And okay. that was actually the first uh, experience I ever had teaching. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was kind of scary then. When um, was that? 2015 okay. so four years four, ago wow, four years ago yeah. yeah and i'll be doing another uh shakespeare tour this fall it'll be othello oh cool yeah you're a big shakespeare fan or is it just kind of like what you what's in front of you you'll take i love shakespeare yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love shakespeare so much i was really lucky to have a really great exposure to shakespeare in high school okay my theater teacher i went to Westside, and we had a shakespeare class we did a shakespeare play every other year and one of her former students, who was then a colleague, um, co-directed everything and and was is is a Shakespeare scholar. And he was the artistic director of Nebraska Shakespeare for a long time, and and he's become a mentor. So through through my connections there, I was able to do uh, Shakespeare on the Green in different okay. capacities for the better part of the last decade. So in short, I love Shakespeare. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, that's cool. So, yeah, because I uh, I studied English literature and stuff in college, so we went through like Shakespeare and Chaucer and stuff like that. And oh my gosh! I always have such a hard time understanding Shakespeare the first time through. Yeah. Like when we talk about it, I'll be like, "Oh, okay, I see where I see what they're saying there," but it, Shakespeare is always hard for me to get into because I just it's hard for me to understand, and so I just never quite follow the story. And mm-hmm. then it was like, well, if I have to have a class to understand the story, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fair. A lot of times, people are put to our students are put to an, a disadvantage yeah. when they're exposed to Shakespeare by reading it because it was never meant to be read anyway. It's a it's performance, yeah. yeah. So you're sitting in a class reading the script. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right. Which, yeah, that, that makes sense because like when, when we would talk about it, it was always like in context of here's what they were doing. And then it's like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. But I've never had a, I never had a theater class where I got like performed it. So it never really made it didn't Obvious come sense. alive for you. Yeah, right. Yeah, it was just yeah, it was just reading on paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's unfortunately how a lot of uh, young people are exposed to Shakespeare for the first time. And that's just unfortunate yeah. because it, it should be read aloud and it should be performed. And that's that's really what did it for me was yeah. having that exposure in that way. So you had a pretty good a theater program at Westside then mm-hmm. when you were going to school? Yeah. Oh, was yeah. that your introduction to theater? Did you Had you done stuff before that? Um, I had a bit of a different kind of performance experience before high school. I grew up doing ballet, uh, classical ballet with the Omaha Theater Company when they were with the Rose. And so I did the Nutcracker every every year, uh, as well as other ballets that they would produce. And this is a professional ballet company. It was the only one in Omaha or in Nebraska at the time. And so I got experience performing with professional ballet dancers. And I would do Nutcracker, and I did a Midsummer Night's Dream as a as a ballet, and Dracula, and Sleeping Beauty. So, it was my first taste of performance. And with the with the dancing and the ballet, there's also pantomime and acting. Sure. And then when I was twelve years old, I played Clara in the Nutcracker, and she's she's the one that gets the Nutcracker. It's the story okay. about her. And there's a lot of dancing in that, but it's mostly storytelling and it's sure. mostly acting. And that really kind of piqued my interest. But even even before then, well, around the same time, I I actually did a cartoon voice. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For so, which cartoon? Uh, Strawberry Shortcake. No way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it, awesome. <laughs> thanks. It, I don't think it was like on TV, but it was on HBO, I think. And um, it was recorded here in Omaha. How old were you when you did that? I started when I was nine, and I, I did it until I was 14, I think, so a freshman in high school. Wow. So how do you how do you find stuff like that? Like at nine years old, how do you find your way into being a voice actor? <laughs> right? Uh, I, I was very blessed and lucky in that way. My – she's not quite blood relative, but uh, my aunt, Pam Carter – who has since passed, she was the uh, vocal director for the show. Oh, okay. And so uh, she was a Omaha famous actor. She had uh, performed with Nebraska Shakespeare the very first summer that they ever did anything oh, wow. for Shakespeare on the Green. She played Catherine in 
Taming of the Shrew. And she would she performed at the Rose and the Blue Barn, and she was the vocal director for that. So she auditioned me. Mm-hmm. I was nine. I actually replaced someone on the show. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's how I got involved in that. So is anybody else in your family like a performer or just your aunt? Yeah. Well, in, in Strawberry Shortcake, my cousin was also in it. And let's see, my another cousin performed, uh, went to the same high school. He was five years older than me. And actually watching him do theater in high school really, really inspired me yeah, to yeah. do it. Um, and he went to Loyola Marymount in, in L.A. And he has since become an actor as well. Oh, wow. Um, my dad did theater in high school and college as well. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's this is kind of in the family then. Like, it is. <laughs> natural thing. Because yeah. I know your sister is does dance. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it just seems to be run in the family. Does your mom do anything like that or did she? She didn't do any performing growing up or, or as an adult, but she is an artist as well. She was a photographer, is a photographer for all of her life. She has lots of film cameras and that that's her art. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah. What kind of stuff did you do in high school then beyond Shakespeare? Talk yeah. about that. and Well, in high school... We, we did do my very first play that mm-hmm. I did was Shakespeare. It was Romeo and Juliet. Okay. And I got to do the prologue. So the uh, two households, both alike in dignity yeah, and fair yeah. Verona, where we lay our scene, that speech. And I did like You Can't Take It With You, which is a classic American comedy. I did To Kill a Mockingbird. Okay. And I played Scout. And that was really instrumental in my growth as a person and an actor. How so? I mean, it's an iconic story. It's an important story. Scout is an iconic character, uh-huh. and she'll always be in here, I think. <laughs> and and my mentor directed that. Okay. And he has since been a mentor, you know, since then. Ever since then, yeah. Oh, yeah. I also did um, Tennessee Williams' Not About Nightingales, which is a lesser-known play, mm-hmm. but it's, it's very brutal. It takes place in a prison. It's about a prison riots and hunger strikes, and it's very it's oh, very yeah. intense for a high school to do it. But <laughs> yeah, I it thought like we it. did it justice. Nice. Yeah. And my senior year, I did Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which is two minor characters from Hamlet. Okay. And it's, it's by Tom Stoppard, who um, – general audiences would know him possibly as uh he he wrote shakespeare in love okay maybe fact check that for well, me, but i'm pretty <laughs> sure fact he did. check yeah sure yeah um <laughs> so he wrote that play and it's it's these two characters in hamlet but it's their perspective of what mm-hmm. happens during hamlet oh geez to hit the <laughs> mic so Hamlet comes in and out and he they these two characters always talk about oh he's talking to himself which is a reference to his seven soliloquies where he's speaking to the audience and it's very absurdist and existential and it's a lot of one-liners back and forth a lot of witty banter and it's a very very difficult play and we did it in high school and it was I was one of the two I was Guildenstern so wow yeah that's pretty cool yeah so go back to the playing the part of Scout Mm mm-hmm What was it about that that was really transformational for you that really, besides like, you know, this is a very serious character. Talk about that character and what that was like to step into that compared to like what were you doing before that? Yeah. I mean, what I was doing before that, before even starting to do theater was pantomime acting through ballet. So my my training was in classical ballet. So I was developing that technique and and that training and that appreciation um, and that discipline that you need as a dancer. Sure. So the storytelling part of it didn't really come till I got those characters where that was more important. Right. But a lot of times with learning those roles, you're watching someone else do it mm-hmm. and you're just kind of mimicking what they do. Okay. And then when you, as an actor, and maybe you don't really know this in high school, but as an actor, you have to develop things yourself. Right. And it has to come organically. And obviously, you are being directed and you are being guided in in, in the direction that the director wants you to go. But for Scout in particular, I had just read that book. I think that was my junior year in high school. So I had just read To Kill a Mockingbird for the first time my sophomore year. Okay. So it was still fresh in my brain. Yeah, yeah. And as a as a young person, as a young girl, as a tomboy, I, I really related to Scout in that way. And that was my first real world application of racism. Oh okay. and the political and social justice side that eventually like I've I've since wanted to become well rounded and well versed in and understanding of that. But that was the first time that theater spoke about that in my career. Yeah. But it was my first exposure to that in a way where I was 
telling that story, helping to tell the story. And of course, it's an iconic story. Most people have read it. But to be able to experience that story as that character and learning what Scout was learning at at the same time yeah. was really beautiful. And and also as an actor, it's a, it's a big role. It's a lead role. Right. Um, in the the play version or the one that we did, Adult Scout, so Jean Louise, in the in the novel, it's from her perspective. She's speaking about when she was a child. And so that's kind of what the play does as well. Jean Louise is is a narrator character watching everything happen. And Scout, at the young age when everything's happening, that's who I played. But it was just a really amazing experience. And it's kind of weird to, to talk about it because it's been 10 years since yeah, I yeah. played that part. That still re- that experience still resonates with you though really powerfully. Yeah, because like, you were saying that that was like one of the first characters you felt like this is like you felt like almost a personal relationship mm-hmm. with that character too. Yeah. So like at the same time you're discover like scouts discovering these things about the world, you're discovering them as an actor learning about them through the play while at the same time saying this is also me. I'm almost playing a part of myself mm-hmm. reading this, so I could see how that'd be really. Yeah. Really profound experience at yeah. that age, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And and for and what I've learned since is is there is a part of you in every role you play. Otherwise it's not honest. So sure. So that's the that was the first time I really felt that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, okay. So yeah, so you were really pretty much introduced to the kind of the methodology of, of acting from that perspective from experience. Right. Yeah. I mean I didn't learn that as a as a technique in a in a textbook or mm-hmm. in a class. It was absolutely real world application in rehearsal and in discovery and in performance. Yeah. And it definitely was instrumental in my wanting to become an actor. Sure. In my per- pursuit of that career and that vocation. Was that really kind of the the play that really made you feel like I think this is something I want to do? Or did yeah. were you kind of committed to that beforehand or I think that was it. Yeah. I I I may not have like decided it in my heart or in my brain, but yeah. in my heart I think I did. Like it just stuck with you so much. Yeah. And then and then when I did Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead a year later, that was like another okay, well, I'm doing this. It it's meaningful to me and it's resonating with audiences and it's it's evoking an emotion from them and it's starting conversations and that feels really good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, although I <laughs> decided not to be a theater major when I started college and went into graphic design for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. Chasing the money. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but then that that did not last. <laughs> no. Were your parents pretty supportive of that? Like oh, that yeah. pursuit? I mean, oh, yeah. I figured your dad would probably be like, of course, I did the same stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, my, my parents have been really, really supportive of it. And I mean, as a professional actor, there there might be a little skepticism of like oh yeah cool you're gonna be waiting tables but but (laughs) i i've only ever waited tables once in my life so it's there you go yeah nice (laughs) (laughs) would you so you continued theater through high school and then when you went to college you said you went to you went for graphic design how long did that last before you kind of like this was not the right not not the right decision (laughs) I think a semester. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I ended up taking an intro to theater class for non-majors my very first semester of college okay. because I signed up late and like I didn't know what I was doing and I wasn't a, a major. So I was yeah. like, well, I just still want to be in theater. And then the next semester I took acting one for non-majors because I couldn't get into the, the four majors class. Okay. So I don't think I did declared my major maybe till my sophomore year and then I was able to take the the classes that were intended for majors yeah so I feel like I missed out on a year of (laughs) auditioning for plays because as a theater major you're required to audition for the plays sure whether or not you get in is another thing but at least having that audition experience and even working on a play because if you if you aren't cast or if you would rather work on crews then you you are working on all of the plays so I, I I could have used that, I think. But then my sophomore year, I declared theater as my major, auditioned. The very first play I did in college was Titus Andronicus. So one once again, Shakespeare. A little less charming than Romeo and Juliet. Though. Sure, yeah. What was it that kind of had you made that decision? Was it like being in the theater and that intro class and like, what am I doing with graphic design? Or was it like, I messed up? I need to... Like- <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it was taking those those drawing lab classes that are like four hours long and I'm like I'm not good at this (laughs) I only did this because my sister does it and she's good at it but why am I doing this sure (laughs) I I love these theater classes and I'm good at at it and and the teachers were encouraging and like why aren't you a major so I don't know what was going through my head that first year (laughs) (laughs) that's all right (laughs) so I don't know I guess I don't know what what do they teach in high school compared to college as far as acting and theater and stuff like that what's the difference that you noticed well, in my program at, at Westside, it was acting centric. So uh-huh. our classes were acting well, well, there were there were five levels of it. There was an introduction, which is really the history of theater. There was a focus on on Greek theater and like the parts of theater, stage directions, really the basics of, of what any actor needs. Okay. Then there was an acting class where we did scene work. Um, monologue work. You, we, we would read plays like The Crucible, and uh, we did some Shakespeare in that class. And then there was, we had a play production class. So okay. this was after you did the first two classes. So you had to be a junior or a senior. And in this class, the teacher directed a play with the two sections of the class as the cast. Um, so the first year I did that was we we put up the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged okay which is a originally a play by three men and they just play a bunch of these parts and it's them telling the story in different kinds of ways of all of the Shakespeare plays okay so we expanded that to an ensemble of like 30 kids which uh, allowed for a lot of everyone to be highlighted and everyone to get a chance sure. to to do really fun stuff or to do really serious stuff. And I actually got a chance to do a monologue from Hamlet in that play. Oh, excellent. It's the What a Piece of Work is Man speech, which I've actually <laughs> – uh, it's pretty funny. I, I did that speech again in another production of Complete Works of William Shakespeare <laughs> Bridged for Shakespeare on the Green. Okay. And uh, Vince Carlson, who was my me- is my mentor, he worked with me in high school, so he co-directed that version of Complete Works, and then he directed that for Shakespeare on the Green as artistic director. But let's see, let's see. So, so in the that theater class, my junior year we did that play. My senior year, because you could repeat the class because it's just doing a play. Sure. Um, we did Our Town by Thornton Wilder, which is a you know classic American play. And once again, we expanded that one to a cast of thirty plus kids. And in that play, there's a narrator or the stage manager, as he's called in the script, and he narrates the events of the play um, where it goes through the the life of a girl and, and her family and the, the community. And usually the stage manager is one actor. But in our production, as a high school, we expanded that to a, an ensemble or a chorus yeah, of yeah. stage managers, which was pretty cool. So I got to be a part of that. Um, so you get a lot of kind of really a broad perspective of what it takes to do theater yes. in high school oh yeah do you get really in depth to anything in particular or do they is it does it stay pretty broad it was pretty broad but at the same point in time we had a class dedicated to Shakespeare so the semester after the play production class was Shakespeare and yeah. this was your junior year okay so we did we read Richard the third and Othello and much ado about nothing and that was my first experience with Richard the third which is my one of my top favorite Shakespeare play top favorite plays of all time. Oh yeah. yeah. Richard is just the best villain. <laughs> just the best. Yes. And I actually have since gotten to you know in a way play Richard through Nebraska Shakespeare. They they've created a all female ensemble production every every year as a as a like a staged reading. And a couple years ago we did Richard the Third and all of the women in the ensemble got to share the role of Richard. Oh, so excellent. every scene it would change who got to play Richard. Yeah, so that yeah. was cool. But our Shakespeare class we got to do scene work and we would direct each other and monologues and getting getting that skill that early in my theater career, if you will, was really really good and I mean I grew up going to see Shakespeare on the green almost every summer anyway my aunt was on the board and her son my cousin got to do puck for Shakespeare on the green okay. um, and and even as a kid he was he did Shakespeare on the green so it's always been in there in my life in in some way but anyway back to your question 
then the final class for my high school theater was dramatic literature. That's where we we read plays mm-hmm. and we we uh, did script analysis. Okay, like so, really dissecting what makes this script what it is and mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of it wasn't necessarily theater history, but it was a lot of plays from different parts in American or or Western theater. It was mostly Western. So we've read things like Equus, which is Peter Schaefer, who yeah. wrote Amadeus, Night Mother by Marcia Norman. Yeah. Yeah. We read a lot of really great ones. Going from high school to college, what is the big difference as far as what happens in college as far as what you start studying compared to what you were doing in high school? Mm-hmm. In college, your courses become very much more specific to whatever part of theater you're going into. Okay. So for me, I was an acting directing focus. Okay. There was also um, design focus. So state or stage management focus, lighting design, set design. So do you declare these focuses when you go in or is yeah, it? Yeah. You don't, I don't think you have to declare them right away because it does dictate what your coursework right, is right. and what classes you take. So it, fairly early on, you had to declare that. Have at least some idea where you want to start, I suppose. Yes. Do you definitely. get, is it possible to like, kind of weave through some of those if you're trying to figure out what part of this really fits you yeah yeah there was also a general theater study studies focus um or you could be unfocused i think that sounds really bad but like (laughs) you know you didn't go into a specific Um, i think most people who go to college are rather unfocused right so i I think that's fair that you have a you just kind of put that into the curriculum (laughs) yeah yeah i don't know if it was called unfocused but it may have been just general theater but um i mean i knew that i wanted to be an actor i did not want to be a director at all sure. so that part scared me um <laughs> and my junior year I took a directing one class and I really didn't enjoy it I didn't feel like it resonated with me I just tried to get through it directing scared me I didn't feel like I knew how to talk to actors or create the blocking of a scene oh yeah and it just felt weird and bad and I was like I would so much rather just act has that changed at all for you like being a little further down the road now like having done it a little more oh yes yeah (laughs) oh yes and actually my senior year the next year I took advanced directing okay and that was when I was like oh my god I want to do this sure I have to do this and in my directing class I remember I did because we had different assignments throughout the semester one of them I did Henry the Sixth, Part Two, nice. also Shakespeare, <laughs> probably the most random one I could have yeah. done. But I love the histories, and it's the the middle of of a trilogy, okay, which comes after Henry the Fifth and before Richard the Third, so it's right in the middle right, there. Yeah. And then I did a scene from Sweeney Todd. Uh, we did one of the songs from Sweeney Todd. Oh, excellent! And I just I loved every minute of it. Yeah. I was so excited by these scripts and these stories and the directorial concepts, which they were just a scene in class. But yeah. finding a thesis of what you want that play to say or what you are trying to say with that scene or that play was so exciting to me. Yeah. Yeah. So that was something I was not expecting. But along with the coursework, you also get an opportunity to perform. So I got to do a couple shows every year. I did the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, which was the first musical I'd ever done where I actually sang in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and because I did West Side Story in high school, but I was the one character. I would be surprised to find out you didn't do West Side Story at I West know. Side High School, right? <laughs> yeah, I feel right? like that's got to be like necessary. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but I was the one role. Of all of them that did not sing or dance. But then in college, I did Spelling Bee, which I had never... I had sang a little bit when I did Strawberry Shortcake, but I didn't... I was, like, freaked out by singing. I stopped doing choir classes after middle school. I was like, this scares me. I don't want to do it. Even though I loved to sing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. What was it about singing you think, like, really freaked you out all of a sudden? Uh, I was critical of myself. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, I... Being isolated from my class, maybe in like middle school choir or something, just like freaked me out. Middle school is a, a weird, bad time. So oh, like yeah, absolutely. that <laughs> time in your life to have the opportunity to like have a solo, which for some kids is great, but I was definitely not brave enough to do that. And I think that psych- I psyched myself out yeah. with it. And so I did not do choir in high school, which would have been way more useful than 
some art classes, <laughs> even though I loved art classes. I loved it. All my friends were art kids, but anyway. So yeah, I didn't I didn't really have the training or the experience or confidence with singing. Okay. But we had a really great music director and I I developed the a, a skill and and confidence with it and it was a fun show. It was such a fun show. So that was good. It is a little bit ironic that you get more self-conscious singing. But I think like as a singer, it, is, it, just, it just seems like there's more pressure to sound a certain way. Whereas being like in, in acting, I feel like there's the pressure is almost be, to be more who you really are. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like going into doing theater in high school, for example, the Romeo and Juliet, I had the first speech in the play. Yeah. I had never performed while sp- I had never been speaking while performing my prior experience on stage was all dance so there's no speaking so it was really f- scary at first to do a monologue on stage but I don't know why that's easier for me than singing <laughs> <laughs> right yeah I mean without any training or without- well I guess because you don't nobody cares if you're out of tune on a monologue right like they're not listening to your right. tone or something maybe I su- maybe because we consume so much music sure and people are very critical of it in of different kinds of music or different singers or I, when you go to see someone live you know it's very easy to critique them there are yeah. very specific like technical things that a non trained singer can cr- can criticize you on. oh yeah absolutely but when when you're acting i mean yeah i guess maybe the language of criticism is not as popularly well known in right. acting as it is in music. It's really hard. I like if I see something that I don't like, I know I don't like it. Yeah. But I can't always say why. I'm getting better at that. As far as acting goes. Yeah. yeah One yeah. of my big goals was to be able to create a, a vocabulary for myself for being critical as a director. I want to know how I can speak to actors. Yes. To help them find where I want them to get right so going back to what you said I really honestly can't explain why I was had the confidence or ability to just go out there and speak because it's not something I've ever really thought about honestly like (laughs) I I still get stage fright and I'll still have those that nervous energy before going out there but once you're out there it it's the best feeling absolutely yeah world yeah it's that you are bringing honesty into someone else's life. And not to say that, like, you are bringing your own lived experience into this other fictional person's experience. That's that's certainly a tool you can use. I don't always think that's healthy. But finding the honesty within yourself to create the circumstances in which this character is going to say these words organically. Characters are never remembering their lines the actors right, remembering yeah. their lines the character is thinking of what to say next so maybe being able to isolate that part of it and and focusing on the work and the character and the honesty and living through the moment for me is not easier but i have that i don't know <laughs> no I, I i get it i totally yeah because i as far as singing goes you can bring all the honesty you want to it, but if you're not in tune, right? People are just going to say you sucked, <laughs> right? And and like and, also for me, just because I don't have the training, and this is something I was talking to my, uh, I've been taking voice lessons. I don't have the muscle memory of what right, it's supposed yeah. to feel like when you do that, and not that I have any particular muscle memory to like access. This is how you act. That's not a thing. But for me, I know how to work those muscles to find that in the character and it's yeah. it's it's just as technical as the singing except the singing is is so much more physical rather than like metaphysical right yeah absolutely then yeah you can walk away from a performance and say that felt honest that felt true with music or singing it could feel good but it, your performance could also still be terrible, but there's something about like <laughs> if you're if you felt like what you were doing was true and authentic for you on stage as an actor, there's a good chance your performance is pretty awesome. 
I, I should hope so. Yeah. yeah. I know. I mean, I have no authority to speak on what that feels like as a, for a singer or a musical theater sure. actor. But I think it's but. the same thing though. Like a, a musician probably has, has that muscle memory. That's that training mm-hmm. to know, like if I'm behind the mic and I'm singing, I'm probably in tune. Cause I've practiced enough. I know what I'm doing on that level. Whereas like you as an actor, probably like, I know if I'm, when I'm up there talking, I, I know my, my voice is projecting. I'm using the right movements cause I've done it enough. I don't have to think about that stuff. So then it just gets to the, yeah. did that feel authentic? Did that feel real as far as what I was trying to communicate? Yeah. Yeah. Was the character living through the moment? Another mentor of mine, he, he introduced to me that concept of letting the character live through the moment. And in order to do that, you do have to let the actor get out of the way. And that, that sounds like a very like vague way to talk about that. But for me, it's very, it's, it makes total sense because like, if the actor is in their head while you're on stage, while you're saying your lines, while you're doing your blocking, that's all it's going to be yeah. is lines and blocking. It's very surface level. But letting the character live through the moment is letting Anna and all of my critiques of myself, critiques of the audience, if they're responding or not, getting that out of my brain and and not remembering the lines because – that's the actor's job. Once the actor's out of the way, the character knows the lines. Yeah. They know, they feel the lines. So the lines make sense in the moment. That's why they're saying them, not because they remembered, right. or this is what I'm supposed to say after that person talks, but this is the most logically necessary thing for me to say at this point for how I feel and for what's going on in the situation. Yeah. And so, that's actually a big thing that I have learned actually since college yeah. is is the listening part of it. That's I feel like sometimes that's glossed over as like a required element of things. Cause obviously you're listening to hear what the your scene partner is saying and you've listened for your cue line. But if you're not listening to the the words that the character is saying, not just, you know, for your cue, but like the the line ahead of your line always, always lets you know what your next line is sure so for me i i can never really get behind like oh i i forgot my line no the only reason you forgot your line is because you weren't listening or oh, I like weren't that, yeah. focused yeah yeah absolutely I, that's just fascinating what are some of the things that help you kind of forget yourself on that stage and, and to help that helps you really respond as your character when you're performing I mean, first and foremost, the listening part of it. And that that's that's in the moment where you just have to be and and I catch myself sometimes I'm I'm getting critical of like how my body is standing, how what am I doing with my hands? Yeah, yeah. You know, how is the audience responding? Oh, they're not a very vocal audience. No, that doesn't matter. For me, it it is the preparation. If I go into a performance or a rehearsal unfocused and unprepared, that's gonna show in the work. So yeah, talk to talk to me about the preparation that you go through. What's some of the first things you do when you pick up a script for the first time for a new play? Yeah. It's like one of the first things you do. Yeah. Well, you read for plot. Okay. Read for plot just to know what happens, know who everyone is, all of that. Just a first read. Uh, second read is going to be reading for a particular character or reading for, from a particular perspective, like read from that character's perspective, what they go through, what everyone says about them, what they say about themselves. And once you get, once you get to the memorization of it, it's, it's not just memorizing because that if you've memorized your lines, that's the bare minimum of the job. Sure. Yeah. What I try to do when I'm memorizing it, I try to internalize it at the same time. Sometimes for people that might come as the next step. For me, it's way easier to memorize the lines with intention. So I can't just be like, oh, free music fire, oh, free music fire, oh, free music fire, just to like repeating it without any meaning. Sometimes that helps just for like muscle memory. But for me, that muscle memory gets there when the thought is memorized into the lines. Okay. So, so not only are you me- literally memorizing the words, but you're memorizing or internalizing rather the thought that the the character has to get there. So, where where does the breath happen? Where 
why are they breathing at this point? Why, why do they have this thought? Why does this thought come after this particular one? Why does this cue line uh, invoke this response? Yeah. So what works for me is, is thinking about that all at the same time while I am memorizing for logistical purposes. So that sounds like a, a, a memorization technique for you is like, if I know why they're saying this, then I'm just going to remember the lines almost more automatically after that because what else would they say? Right. Yeah, exactly. Memorizing for intention or practicing it with intention. So so even if I'm about to go into a an audition and I just need to run it through my brain, like I'll, I'll say it whether whether quietly or not, but like say it with with the inflection and the pauses and the breath that I that I've built into my performance. Yeah. So yeah, to me it's it's never just the words. It's never just memorizing lines. It's and honestly, that's my least favorite part of <laughs> <Yeah>. the process. <laughs> Sometimes I've I've been bad about just like putting it off or like stressing about it and but then once you get into it, it's it's always the starting of anything that's the hardest part. Once you get into it, it's like you can't stop. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, 100%. Yeah. I had a teacher that would talk about memorize your stuff actively. And so one of the techniques or one of the um, not techniques, but one of the activities, that's the word. <laughs> one of the activities he had us do was to take a, a, a section of text from a script and memorize it, but then also perform some sort of action while you were doing that because that physical action alongside the words you were trying to remember kind of helps contextualize it or something. Oh, or just yeah. like just being active just seems to help memorizing things more so oh, yeah. it was always important to like just get off your feet yeah oh yeah and i'm honestly when i was in high school like rosencrantz and guildenstern for example that's a play with a lot of dialogue a lot of monologues yeah um, yeah and it's it's hard a lot of it doesn't make any sense or it didn't to me then <laughs> but i memorized my lines while juggling oh yeah okay. yeah yeah and i mean it's still something i don't i haven't done that in a while but it was it's totally it's the you, i'm a kinesthetic <laughs> learner yeah so. so do you ever bring any of that to a performance like i just ha i happen to be juggling so one of the things my character is going to do in this scene is i'm just going to pick up some things off this table and just kind of start playing with them uh do i mean you ever, that happened do you ever do that sometimes with with certain plays you've been in that definitely happened during Rosencrantz and Guildenstern a bit. I don't remember if it was like planned, like, oh, you're going to juggle during this or, yeah. hey, juggle during this. But I juggled during a monologue. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. For a lot of actors, sometimes you don't get the script until you start rehearsals or a little bit before starting. And so you have the rehearsal process to memorize your lines. Sure. Sometimes it's required that you have half memorized when you start, and sometimes it's, you know, it's not possible to do that. So, you know, you'll rehearse book in hand for a while for, or for the first time that you run through a scene or block a scene. Then the next time you're running it, there's no script allowed. Yeah, yeah. And for a lot of people, doing the blocking or learning the blocking as you're learning the lines really helps them. And I'm, I'm the same way in that, in that way, but I've also had a few opportunities productions where i've had to be completely off book before getting to yeah. rehearsal like one of the last thing the last show i just did at the blue barn was i and you by lauren gunderson uh -huh. and it's it's two people on stage the, whole, the time, whole time yeah the whole time and there's a lot of monologues there's a lot of banter and dialogue and we had to be off book by day one. Oh my god yeah, yeah. Thankfully, I had my script for four months before that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Definitely. But but it's that thing like it's you it's need hard. Four months for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to learn it if you're not staging it. So do you do you do staging by yourself sometimes just to kind of help you get in there? No. Do you feel like that kind of risks like well, what if I stage it this way and then I get there and we perform it a totally different way? And right. now my brain has totally flipped upside down. Yeah. And that so that's important to like not get so cemented into your brain. Like I'm going to I memorized it this way. I'm going to do it yeah. this way. It's really important to not have that going into it. It's great if you go in. It's better if you go into it prepared to make choices. Sure. on Hey, this line means this. This is how I'm going to, you know, it's going to come out of my mouth. And maybe you plan it that way and maybe it doesn't work for the director and you have to be flexible sure. on that. But what I really, what I've learned in the past few months, you don't always have to say everything the same way, but you also don't have to say everything differently. So like 
if you say one line a certain way in one rehearsal and it comes out the next time you run it, if it comes out differently, yeah, that's great. It's best if you don't plan necessary. Like not not to say you shouldn't plan what you're doing, but when when you have that that freedom to play and change and try things in rehearsal, it opens up the ability to make it different every time without changing the performance. So you're not changing the plot. You're not changing the blocking or the words. Yeah. But it might it might come out differently one way during one performance and it affects your own interpretation of what's happening a little differently. It hits you a different way. Well, or it gives it, you a sense of the possibilities, doesn't it? Yeah, or it invokes a different kind of response from your scene partner. Yeah. And it's especially great when it's a two-person play. <laughs> One caveat with that, you don't want to throw them off. You don't change anything that they're used to. It's but but that's the that's the thing about But you also want to stretch them a little bit and say, like, here's all the potential that this scene could be. Yeah. Let's see how we adjust to this or how we can how we can play with that. And that's really what rehearsal is meant for. It's not just learning your blocking and learning your lines. Yeah. It's that once again, this is a John Hardy quote, my, my one of my mentors. Familiarity with the purpose of abandon. You are so familiar with A, the lines, B, the intentions, C, the the overarching objective sure. that you can try things so many different ways while you are building this story together that that you can it's it's you're so familiar with what you're doing that you have complete freedom yeah yeah freedom within parameters because when you're given complete freedom it's like what do i do but within the constraints of either the play or the scene or the conventions of the universe or the rules that your director's given whether that's the universe or or the rehearsal hall parameters allow you to be free I think that's the that's the hardest thing for any creative is to have a blank page. So I, I, there was a, Jake and Marley's Christmas Carol back in 2010 was done at the Blue Barn in their old location. Mm-hmm. But I got to be part of the rehearsals for that. I did a photo project where I was photographing actors for a little while, kind of like the work that the actors do. No like, way. What does that look like? I think that to me that's infinitely fascinating. I'd love to get back to it. But so my my acting teacher – that I had Doug Blackburn in, in, in Metro. He let me come into some of his classrooms. And I, so I photographed some of his students as they work through stuff. And then he was in this play and he was like, hey, would you want to come photograph this play? And him and Scott Working, who are both teachers of mine, um, were I in that Scott. same play. So oh yeah, it was gosh. really cool because it was like, okay, I, got, I know two people in this. So I went and met the cast and the director and was like, hey, here's the project. Would you guys be okay with me coming in? And, and like li- I'm literally on stage photographing them as they're kind of working through stuff so fascinating i just i freaking loved it and i just remember i remember some of the the things that the actors played with and like the levels they went to remember one guy just in one of the scenes he was trying he like was on the floor and kicking his legs up in the air and it was just like it was clear like let's just see what this looks like let's see how it feels you know and it was just like so eye-opening and to see them work through that was really was really fun that's so cool Oh my gosh, I can only imagine what those photos look like. Oh, there's so much fun. I, I, I made a book out of them. I loved it because it was all on film. So I had this old film camera, this old Leica film camera. Oh, I have a Leica. Excellent. Like yeah. an old film one or like yeah. a digital? Oh, oh yeah. that's so cool. Okay, yeah. you have to show that to me later. Yeah. That's... I don't know where it is. My mom has it somewhere. Okay, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll make her find it some one of these days. Yeah, really? I Because I bought that camera because I, I was wanting to try street photography for a little while. So I had that. And, I, and it was when I was doing street photography and I was kind of studying like what am I looking for what I am looking for out on the street is what actors are creating on the stage that honest human interaction those moments those authentic moments and I'll bet even more that happens behind the scenes yeah and that's where the idea came from it was just like I could go behind the scenes and that's where I would find that authentic human interaction that I'm looking to try to capture and I'm just like, I'm on the floor. I'm around, like, I'm all over. I just, I got permission from them to just like, I'm going to be around you. I'm going to watch to see where you're at so I don't, you don't run into me. But I'm going to be in there as much as I can. And I only had one, I only had a, a guy say anything once. What's his last name? Nils. Holland. Yes. He oh was my, in that performance. I love Nils. 
Yeah, and he there was only one time where he was like, "Hey, do you mind sitting this out?" Because he was trying to work through something, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah absolutely!" Like, yeah. and he was just, he was freaking amazing. Like, he was being able to watch him that close and see him build that character. It was so cool. He, fun fact, when I did Strawberry Shortcake, yeah, he was in that as well. No kidding. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. hilarious. I played the cat, and he played the dog. That's awesome. And I actually just <laughs> did a reading with him at the Blue Barn uh, last week. God of Vengeance, which is the play that their current play, Indecent, okay. is based on, yeah. basically. And and we were we did that just a couple weeks ago. And then a year ago, we did Van Gogh and Me together at the Rose. And he played my dad. And I, just, I, love, <laughs> I love Nels. <laughs> That's so. awesome. Yeah, he was he was fantastic. That was such a fun thing to be a part of. Yeah. Man, have you ever thought of doing that again? Yes, I, I'd love to. It was one of, my, one of the things I'd love to do most. It takes time because like rehearsals go on for weeks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just haven't been able to kind of put myself out there again and be like, hey, I've got the time to do this now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd love to go back to to that. It was some of the most fun I had. I believe that. So I love learning. I love talking to actors. I love learning from like their experiences and things like that. So that's why I was like really excited when you reached out. I was like, oh, this is excellent because I would love to talk to a local actor because I love, I love this stuff. I love talking about it. And, awesome hearing people's experience of it so that's so cool so let's going back now it's kind of a big rabbit trail there (laughs) going back to college was there anything in college i guess that was on the level of scout from high school that kind of took you to the next level as an actor yeah (laughs) yeah um my senior year i played hedda gabler in hedda gabler and it's ibsen so it's um, modern theater from 1890. Okay. I'm trying to even put my wrap my head around <laughs> how immense of an experience it was. So I played Hedda Gabler, and and this character, this role, it's it's one of those on stage the whole time. This play is about this woman who's essentially an antihero, and how 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 our production took it. She's a woman who is oppressed by all of the men in her life. Okay. Her husband, who she never really wanted to be with anyway. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of a whelp. He's kind of just, oh, oh, I'll do what you want, you know, kind of <laughs> yeah. pushover dude. And, and she's she's not about that. And, and her father has since passed away, and his portrait is looming over this house. And, and in our production our amazing set designed by Stephen Williams, um, had these immense walls of steel, like windows that are diagonal from the corners of the room into the center of the ceiling. So this house just oppresses her and the stage was raked so that, so that you go down, downstage to the very end and it's, it's lower than the upstage part. Okay. So all of the men in the play, were and I'm a I'm a short woman. I'm short. <laughs> All of the men in the play were that much taller than me. Wow. And there's there's even a character named Judge Brack who blackmails her and he was played by my good friend Scotty Pace. <laughs> and he's like this is an exaggeration, but twice my height. He's very tall. So it was just a it was it was our director Doug's way of of really visualizing this oppression. Oh absolutely yeah. um but she has a former lover and and he comes back um with this manuscript and she essentially tells him to kill himself <laughs> and she's she's not the villain, yeah, but she's not the hero. yeah, so she I, I she's not evil. But she's like trying to survive, really, it sounds like. It's- yeah, she was trying to survive. And, and our our concept leaned into the possibility of like her being abused as a child, like by her father. And, and she's trying to hold on to this childlike innocence that she doesn't have. Yeah. I, I really haven't thought about this play in a while. But it was very, it was very instrumental in my, in my college theater experience. Because of the content that you were exploring or because yeah. of the way that you had to yes. kind of learn the performance? All of the above. It was a huge role. She's on stage the whole time. Yeah. She she leaves for costume changes and, and she's in, in this oppressive corset, which was really fun and really awful at the same time. It was before I really learned how to listen. Okay. It was before I knew how to be in the moment. And not not to say that I was nervous or not to say that I like couldn't do it, but like 
I was definitely in my head during those shows. Sure. And and critical of myself and and aware of of what was going on, um, like in the audience and who was out there and and all of that because it's the the space at UNO is very intimate, so you can see everyone in the audience. But it was a really beautiful production, and I worked with our assistant director Moira Cregan, who I've since gotten really close with, and she's also become a mentor. And she worked specifically with me on finding this anti-hero and finding her vulnerability and finding how she can be an empathetic character. And this is also what our director helped me with as well. Yeah. Because, you know, she she encourages her former lover to commit suicide and she kills herself because for her, death is better than not being free in, yeah. in her own world, which she could justify for herself and if if you just approach it as she's this evil woman looking to just ruin everyone's lives it's very easy to read it that way but as a as an actor playing playing her you can't do that you can't that, you're not going to yeah, achieve anything that with would be that. that's so one dimensional yeah it is it that way. and right from the beginning the audience is going to hate her even some of the worst people out there they're not bad people to be bad people they're bad people only because the way they're trying to accomplish their goals goes against what we think is okay and right. Right, as a societal norm. Yeah, there's there's always a vulnerability there. There's something that they want that they feel they're justified to have. And there's uh, usually there's starts with very good intentions or very good desires that just kind of evolve into desire to survival mode, to desperation, and then suddenly that's, their actions start to become bad things. Mm-hmm. They're you know, coping. They're, they're coping, right? Or they're yeah. desperate, or they're they're lonely, they're sick. Like there's something that they're hurting. Mm-hmm. There's some sort of pain behind that, right? Which is what causes them to act that way. And yeah, I, I don't think you can ever play somebody just being a one dimensional. I, I wouldn't want to play a one dimensional bad guy because no, God, there's just nothing that feels real about that, right? And that's why it was so important to me to make her or find um, how she is a sympathetic character because if she's not sympathetic like okay she can be three-dimensional and not be sympathetic yeah but the play is about her she's on stage the whole time it's about the interactions with everyone else and and what sh- what her actions are that create a series of events that destroy everyone's lives yeah and there has to be that sympathy for her to understand why she does what she does it's not a happy play, but it's beautiful, <laughs> and and it was really a privilege to play that, and it was my first time playing an anti-hero or a villainous person of some yeah. kind, and that you have to have sympathy. They have to be sympathetic. Yeah. yeah. So, like, compared to, like, the performance of, like, Scout, did you feel like you saw much of yourself in this character, or was that harder to find yourself in that character early on, or, you know, did you find yourself, or did you just find a way to... F- to kind of understand yeah i think there's a part of me in every role i've played sure i don't want to i certainly wouldn't call myself an a head of gabbler you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's maybe not like <laughs> likable but absolutely uh, a woman in a society that oppresses women yeah you know and so many other marginalized communities and and coping coping with with oppressive figures and oppressive situations I think we can all relate to that in some sure. capacity, but I mean, I I was able to separate myself from her situation in order to look at how she she copes and deals with her situation at on, on a healthy level. Yeah, and and I think that that's maybe where some growth happened between you know high school theater and college theater is that you start looking at scripts and characters in that way. Yeah, because you're not just pretending to be someone else and not that i thought that in high school but well, without the skill and the yeah. experience you know that's kind of the, the the stage one assumption of actors like oh you're just pretending to be somebody else right i think it's only as you get deeper into it that you realize it's more than it's not just pretending it's finding me in that character and relating to them on that level so that i'm feeling what they're feeling or i have felt what they're feeling mm-hmm. and so i understand how and why these words are coming out of their mouths yeah or I, as an actor, maybe can't relate to their situation, right. but I can conjure it in myself to understand on a visceral level why they do what they do. Yeah. And then that's that's how you are them. For me, it's important to not um, try and relate everything to my own life. Sure. That's abs- – and I think I said this before, but, like, it's a tool to use, definitely. Yeah. But 
I, I like like with the method acting thing. I just don't think that's healthy. You know? Well, you can certainly take that too far. Yeah. There's certainly people who, <laughs> who have, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's like you said, like finding a way, whether or not you've experienced what this character is going through, like you, there is a way in which you can relate or find something that parallels what their plight yeah. or like Hamlet, for example. Uh-huh. He's a prince of Denmark. It, it No, who can relate to that? <laughs> right. You know, yeah. but yet the play is about a family dynamic. And a dysfunctional family and drama that happens within a family. and, and Which is what most everybody can relate to. Right. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to be a prince from Denmark to have that going on. And yeah. that's why he's the everyman. He's he's the, the most human. He inv- What is it? Shakespeare invented the human with Hamlet. Yeah, is yeah. what they say. So, yeah. Yeah. Studying acting was one of the most eye-opening ways to learn empathy i feel like oh my gosh yeah because it's like your your job is to understand all these characters in a very real way and it's not like characters as invented things but it's characters as reflection of humanity because if it's not reflecting from real life then it it's not going to resonate with anybody if it's totally made up i feel like acting was where i really learned like here's an art form where you your job is to learn empathy oh yeah that is why i do what i do because I couldn't always put a put a put my finger on like why do I do this other than yeah. I love it, but it's it's that it's the human connection. We love movies. We consume TV so much and and internet and whatever and like all of the the, the media that we have. But like we love movies and TV in particular because they're it's storytelling mm-hmm. and humans have always loved storytelling and that's that's why legends exist and things get passed down from storytelling. Yeah. But the one thing about theater that makes it different than film, TV, any kind of other performance art is that they're humans speaking in front of you in real time. And they're experiencing these very human conditions that we've all in some capacity dealt with in one way or another, as abstract or literal as we want to take it. And that's there's nothing that compares to that consumption of that art once it's happening it's happening in real time once it's over it's over and it only exists in your memory well and you know what's really fascinating about that is it's not just about the humans that they're trying to portray on that stage for you it's humans trying to be other humans so while there's a play happening on that stage there's this other play of actors trying to be be actors be professionals on the stage to tell this story to entertain this audience or to make this meaningful connection. There's like these multiple layers of of like human storytelling happening. It's not just what the script says, but it's also what's going on between these these people on stage, this man and this woman who have been rehearsing this for months or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they're like, are they remembering all their lines tonight? Mm-hmm. You know, like or is is one of them sick? Did did she just break up with her boyfriend? Did he just get a divorce? Like you don't know this stuff, but that's all potentially what's happening while they're trying to relay the story and so i think that's just just as fascinating we're like the same stuff happens with actors on tv and movies Mm -hmm. but that's not happening in front of you right that's happening outside of the production you know outside the production team and stuff like that so there's like this this distance between those things but when it's a theater like that's real people up there trying to tell you a story that resonates with you but they've also got their own that they're working through at that moment and their real world situations might be informing their performance that night absolutely yeah that's so i've never thought about it that way that's really cool i've heard other theater actors talking about like there's no two performances that are alike Mm -mm. and that's all the stuff that fuels that yeah because it's that's why there's no two performances alike because no two nights are the same yeah i mean they say you know leave it at the door and try as we might we it doesn't always happen you know like I'm in a show right now, like last week, the, the performances felt so much different than they feel this week. And I don't necessarily know why, Sure. but even though the performance, the, the show itself has gotten tighter and tighter and, and more consistent yeah. with timing and, and inflection and, and all of the things, it still feels like it feels different. Not that it's a different show, but it feels different. Yeah. And that's also why I do what I do is because we get to tell these stories and every audience that receives it will receive it differently, whether that's from us or from them, from their own perspective, right, what right. they're bringing into the space that day, what we're bringing into the space that day. We're all here for the same purpose. 
but we all have so many different experiences in coming into it. Yeah, absolutely. That switch between I'm an actor, but now I, I, I actually love directing. What has that meant for you as far as where you want to go? Well, for for me as an actor, because I, I think I consider myself an actor first. Sure. Just because I have more experience with it. It is my first passion. Directing is is a f- more of a future goal that I want to immerse myself in as much as I possibly can. Yeah. But for acting, it is important for me to pursue paid work. Yeah. So that kind of limits a lot of what I can do. Sure. Um, just in general, but in, in Omaha. But um, I've been able to do almost exclusively paid work within being in school, you know, every summer and then since graduating. But also, if it's not a project I'm really excited about, like I'm not really going to pursue it. Yeah, it's but not just about the money. It's got to be it's got to be worth your time in a sense. Yeah, exactly. A story I'm excited about. Sure. That's what I love about Omaha theater is that there is there's there is a lot of theater to consume and everyone is choosing to do such great shows. All the theaters in town paid or otherwise do really important work. There's not a ton of paid work in Omaha and that's, you know, a lot of people may get their training here and and start off here and then they go elsewhere. But I think Omaha's ready to grow in sure. that way for professional actors. Do but you see yourself doing that? Like going beyond Omaha to, to pursue? I'd like to. Yeah? Yeah. I don't know when. Do you see yourself taking a more like Hollywood direction or more New York theater kind of direction? Well, I mean, if Hollywood came calling, I certainly wouldn't <laughs> would turn, turn it, it away. Down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've thought about New York. Yeah. But also it's so saturated and a lot of it is like musicals and like broadway bound stuff and i I don't i don't know if that's really my market i mean right now like i really love being in omaha and at least having a home base here sure. so my next goal is to start doing more regional work whether that's tours or you know a contract here a contract there but like being based in omaha there is paid work in omaha and there's a lot of really great potential for growth and opportunity here and i I want to bring it back to Omaha. Sure. I want ultimately want to bring what I learn and what I what I consume and and receive as far as training and experience. I want to bring it to Omaha. What do you, what is kind of the goal for grad school for you when you think about doing that? What do you think you hope will come from that experience? Well, my initial thought like immediately after undergrad was like I'm going to get my MFA in directing. Yeah. So I can artistic direct someday. And maybe that's in the cards, but I think if I were to do that, I would really have to focus on directing right now yeah and there's it's it's not it's not an easy job to get into directing um i i have an assistant directed a few times and directed one thing on my own and i'll get to do another thing later this summer but i'm not quite i don't think i have the skills or experience to maybe pursue that full time sure so i i think i'd like to do an mfa in acting Build on what you have. Yeah, yeah. And, and keep building on the skills because I know there are programs around the country that their acting MFA includes directing skills. Yeah. So I, I'd like, I think, to go that route. Have you, like, are there companies that you can, that aren't necessarily like degree programs, but companies where you could, so what I'm thinking of, have you ever heard of the Groundlings in LA? Yeah. Yeah, where you can go, you, you basically audition to be part of that, but it's like a program where you develop as I, th- I think it's specifically comedic actors and improvisation, but you develop and th- you go through a series of courses mm-hmm. and coming out of that, a lot of people get work. So you don't have a degree, I don't think necessarily, but you have the experience of being able to say, I've been through the Groundlings program up through this level. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there things like that that you've looked at as far as the, the kind of acting work you want to do? Yeah. I mean, th- there's a, there's the Del Arte school in California, which is all commedia mask work and, and stock character work and very physical comedy or okay. physical theater. I know there's a program with the Steppenwolf in Chicago, but there's, there's Shakespeare and company in Massachusetts. Oh, that okay. is a yeah, world yeah. renowned actor training company specifically with Shakespeare. Yeah. And I know they're doing a, a workshop like uh, in Aurora, Maybe it's maybe it's this weekend or next weekend. <laughs> but like I saw the 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 fee for <laughs> tuition, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh, maybe next time. Yeah. But I mean, that would be a dream. That would be a dream. Sure. Well, and especially with actors, 
I don't feel like anybody really cares what your degree is as much as like, can you play this role? Right. The, the degree is just kind of a way to learn the techniques, the history, the background that kind of make you a more well-rounded person when you step on that stage. But when it comes down to it, all they care about is what can you do with this script right now? And is it what yeah. we want? Absolutely. I have, so, I have a lot of friends who didn't go to college for theater at all. Yeah. And they're brilliant actors. For me, like I'm really glad I went for, for theater because it focuses in on the things that you will have to apply in real world situations. Yeah. And I, I, I really, I, I liked that and appreciated that even though at the time I was probably very unfocused and, and <laughs> unmotivated and whatever, but who, what college kid isn't? Right, exactly. I think what it is, for me, it teaches discipline. Yeah, And absolutely. as an actor, you do need discipline. You need to be able to hold yourself accountable to be responsible for, A, learning your lines, you know, B, being responsible and, and reliable in your rehearsal. And to your cast and to your director and, and everyone else who's relying on you. And not that you can't learn that without a college experience, because you absolutely can. But That's it's, just a, it's almost like a safer place to learn some of that, though, too. It's a place for you to fail. Yeah. And it's it's OK because it's a learning environment. If you're you know thrown out into the professional world without either having made those mistakes or without being told this is how you do things yeah. <laughs> you're not going to get hired by that company if you mess up again well the stakes are the stakes are higher because if you mess up you might lose the job whereas right. in school you mess up you you lose a couple you lose a class it's you know you're like you, you, you come back yeah. to the next class and you're you pick it right back up or something but. and really i think that's the biggest takeaway ultimately is that it is a safe place to fail and to learn and to try again and to be encouraged when you may not get that in the professional world yeah. hopefully you find mentors and colleagues and peers and friends that'll be there for you but ultimately it's your responsibility for yourself totally yeah totally do you know who alicia oxy is have you heard no. of her she's got a podcast called that one audition which i started listening to a couple months ago uh -huh. and she interviews basically like working actors so it's the actors who like aren't the faces that you just know automatically. They're not the Matt Damons and the, and the Gwyneth Paltrow's and things like that. They were in the movies a lot of times with these big names. You go back and you look and you're like, that's right. I totally remember them. Mm -hmm. I love it because it's, it's actors who are working and people who are like, they're going they're They've got a hundred TV shows to their credits or something. Not like five big giant movies necessarily that they're known for. Right. These are the people that they're in the commercials you see. They're in the TV shows that you watch. They're all these people around that just make up the industry. And mm -hmm. it's so fascinating because they talk about what it's like to be a working actor and what it takes and things like that. I think uh, if, so if you haven't listened to it, I think you should check it out. Cause it's, it's called that one audition, that one audition. Cool. And like her premise is like, there's, you know, for a lot of them, there's that one audition that really kind of kicked things off or that one performance or something that changed their course or, or set them on the path that they're on and stuff like that. But they talk about everything around really fascinating. That sounds um, amazing. I'll have yeah. to check it out. Yeah. I think you'd really love it. And I, I wanted to make sure we brought it up because it's like, if anybody's listening to this, as a working actor or want to be a working actor, you got to check that out, that podcast out because I think it's really, it's really great to hear that side of it. Yeah, those are the real things that you experience as an actor that you don't learn in school. That your first agent probably isn't going to be your best, your your forever agent. They right. might be, and if they are, fantastic. But they might not be. And you know what is the value of having a manager? And one of the common themes is like going out of an audition and having everybody like that was great. You did perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for thinking you got it only to find out actually you yeah. know but all that stuff all that 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 if you don't know about it that's out there could be really heartbreaking mm -hmm. but if you hear that oh that's just sometimes how it goes it's not about me it's the industry oh yeah it's not about me yeah. <laughs> yes that's biggest thing yeah, yeah yeah but yeah i think that's a i think that's a great podcast too to, to listen to for anybody that is trying to be a working actor oh yeah well this has been awesome. I could, I feel like we could talk for hours about this stuff. Totally. I find this really fascinating. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. This has been really fun. Thank you so much for having me. That's been a blast.
So that was a lot of fun. Thank you again to Anna for coming on the podcast and sharing your story and being so enthusiastic about um, sharing what it's been like for you as an actor um, so far in your career. I think there was a lot of really good insight for anybody who uh, wants to be an actor, is trying to be an actor. I thought that was really insightful and really helpful to know some of that information and some of those experiences. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Like I said, I could have talked to her for, for hours. I love this topic of the work of actors. And so thank you again for being on here, Anna. I had a lot of fun. If you want to know more about what Anna's doing or where you can connect with her, check her out at AnnaKJordan.com if you want to know more information. Thank you guys again for listening to this episode. Again, if you haven't already, uh, I'd love for you to give me a ranking on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're listening. Give me a review if you like. Uh, let me know what's working, what isn't working. Or you can send me an email. I'm at bjcarry at gettoknowyournarrative.com. That's B-J-C-A-R-Y at gettoknowyournarrative.com. Send me an email. Let me know what you think so far, what things are working, what's not working, or if you have any questions that you have when it comes to getting to know your narrative or topics that you'd like me to talk more about. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, I really appreciate you guys listening. I appreciate you being part of this community. And hopefully you guys are getting some value out of this. So thank you guys again for listening. I'll talk to you on the next episode. 